Hi, good evening everyone. Welcome to the Whitney. Uh, my name is Megan Hoyer. I'm the Director of Public Programs and Public Engagement here. Um, I want to begin tonight by acknowledging that we are here on unceded indigenous lands, specifically the territory of the Lenape. As a Museum of American Art, the Whitney recognizes the ongoing displacement of Native people by the United States and affirms the work that is being done to dismantle the effects of this colonial legacy. I make this acknowledgement tonight especially because the ways in which art can address the absences in, quote, official histories and help us find ways to write new ones is central to Zoe's work and uh, I think to this conversation. So it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's panel, Continuous Signals, on the work of Zoe Leonard, which brings together a group of thinkers whose research, writing, and exhibition making, among other activities, reflects a deep engagement with this artist and with a constellation of ideas and commitments that are at once aesthetic, political, and personal. The occasion, um, is of course Zoe's wonderful show, Survey, currently on view on the fifth floor, um, and you have another 10 days or so to see it. It closes June 10th, but um, I expect you all have seen it once, so go see it again. Um, looking across Zoe's career, the show highlights her engagement with a range of themes, including the history of photography, gender and sexuality, loss and mourning, migration, displacement, and the urban landscape. More than it focuses on any particular subject, however, Zoe's work slowly and reflectively calibrates vision and form. A counterexample to the speed and disposability of imid culture today, these photographs, sculptures, and installations ask the viewer to re-engage with how we see. I want to thank my colleague Elizabeth Sherman, who organized the presentation of the show at the Whitney. And since this is our final program in conjunction with the show, I have to take a moment to express my profound gratitude to Zoe Leonard who has been an extraordinary collaborator on developing the public programs for the show and creating really dynamic and compelling discursive events, by which I mean incredible people gathering together to talk to each other about big ideas. Thank you, Zoe. Um, so the idea for this event truly came out of the ongoing dialogue that Zoe has with each of the four speakers, and also through, um, if what I just said didn't um, explicitly say this through very many conversations between Zoe, um, Elizabeth, and myself. Um, as we discussed each of their projects and the ways in which they have engaged with Zoe's work, the theme of history of a kind of historical work began to emerge. The title, Continuous Signals, is borrowed from Zoe's text, A Continuous Signal, an essay of excerpts and quotations, which is published in the catalog of Analog, one version of which appears upstairs. The text, like the photographs in analog, is a meditation on photography, landscape, memory, New York, time, among other things. I don't even want to try to summarize it here, um, but if you'll permit me the liberty, I have to, my, my summary is that it's like a more readable and shorter arcades project. <laughs> or that's what I thought of when I was reading it last night. So um, you should all read it. <laughs> Um, and I just want to leave you with one of the fragments that has been stuck in my mind from, um, from that essay since I reread it in preparation. Um, and then I'll introduce the, the speakers and, um, and then the program will unfold from there. So this quote is from Ni Via Snipole. Sun and rain and bush had made the site look old, like a site of a dead civilization. The ruins spreading over so many acres seemed to speak of a final catastrophe. But the civilization wasn't dead. It was the civilization I existed in and in fact was working towards. And that could make for an odd feeling. To be among the ruins was to have your time sense unsettled. You felt like a ghost, not from the past, but from the future. You felt that your life and ambition had already been lived out for you and you were looking at the relics of that life. You were in a place where the future had come and gone. Um, so our first speaker tonight is Laura Guy. Um, Laura lectures in fine art, critical studies and, at the Glasgow School of Art and is undertaking postdoctoral research at the University of Edinburgh as part of the three-year project, Cruising the 70s, Unearthing Pre-HIV AIDS Queer Sexual Cultures. She is currently working on a book discuss, focusing on lesbian visual culture after the 1960s. Lynn Cook is Senior Curator of Special Projects in Modern Art at the National Gallery of Art. 
Most recently, she organized the brilliant and critically acclaimed exhibition Outliers in American Vanguard Art, which um, critically, <laughs> too many criticallys, which examines the category of outsider or self-taught artists through moments of fertile intersection with the so-called mainstream art world. The exhibition, exhibition recently closed at the National Gallery and will open at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta later this month before traveling to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in the fall. Darby English's research probes art's interaction at the level of its production, description, interpretation, and analysis with instituted forms of historical subjectivity and experience. Recent research has focused on artistic and other cultural manifestations of optimism, discomposure, and interculture. He's the author of 1971, A Year in the Life of Color, and from 2016, and How to See a Work of, of Art in Total Darkness um, from 2007. He also contributed to the catalog for Lynn's show. We'll mention that too. Um, a new monograph to describe a life, essays at the intersection of art and race terror will be published by Yale University Press, I believe this fall, 2018. Um, and the book synthesizes material first presented as the Richard D. Cohen lectures at Harvard in um, 2016. And then finally, um, Elizabeth Sherman, last but not least, <laughs> Elizabeth Sherman is an assistant curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art. She organized the Whitney's presentation of Zoe Leonard's survey. Other recent projects include um, the, between, the exhibition Between the Waters on view currently in the lobby gallery through July, um, and the first solo museum exhibition of the artist Bunny Rogers. Um, so please join me in welcoming Laura to the podium. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank um, Christine um, Sandoval, Isabel Dow, um, and Megan Hoyer um, for making my trip from the UK possible, um, and to Zoe, of course, for extending the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so in 2013, I was looking for an entrance uh, to the High Line when I passed below this advertisement for self-storage. The building houses a series of domestic scale storage units and, um, I read later, the headquarters for the New York Drug Enforcement Administration. In precarious times, the advertisement that appeals to a newly emergent homosexual consumer makes an equation in which equality is exactly equal to property. Ooh. Um, I thought of this advertisement when I visited the High Line in 2016 to see Zoe's um, 1992 text, I Want a President, reproduced as an outsized bill um, poster papered um, to the struts of a hip hotel. In the run-up to the last presidential election, the reappearance of the text recalls a time um, in which the public sphere underwent significant reorganisation. This transformation was twofold. On the one hand, it is reflected through the grassroots activism occurring in the context of the AIDS crisis. On the other, it is a transformation that was solidified through policy enacted by successive right-wing governments. The consequences of the latter are keenly felt in this area um, where radical urban gentrification and cultural regeneration have been particularly pernicious. Against the historic erasure that is both function and consequence of these processes, I wonder, hopefully perhaps, if the billboard constitutes a kind of queer clutter that can't be cleared away. Manifestos of forms um, that have circulated widely within LGBTQ social movements. Often written in the future tense, these texts are both shaped by and eschew the material conditions of the present within which they were written. Doing so, they activate complex temporal registers in order to disturb accepted epistemologies and make claims to self-determination, to becoming subjects of history. I Want a President is a text written through with these complex temporalities. Written at a time of massive loss of life due to government um, negligence and systemic homophobia, the rhetorical device I Want and the multiple subjects it prefigures suggest a future that might be otherwise, while simultaneously shuttling us backwards to somewhere down the line when we might have began to learn that a president need not always be a clown, a John, a liar, a thief. 
Originally written for the New York-based QW magazine, which folded before it could be published, I Want a President has had a kind of queer life over the past 10 or so years, as it has travelled from the artist's personal archive through DIY publications, art world spaces, public squares and online platforms. Read anachronistically, that is, out with the present on which its original meaning was contingent, the complex temporalities always embedded in the manifesto form seem amplified. Um, so what does it mean to encounter I Want a President hanging alongside other of the artist's works in a gallery? Within the topographically framed survey, this unsigned document locates the concerns of Zoe's work, at least partially within a scene of queer feminist activism. It indicates that a body of work emerges from and finds meaning within a community in ways that underline feminist critiques of authorship. But beyond simply serving as a device that anchors Zoe's work within a context that is already well known, particularly, I imagine, to many of you here, the inclusion of I Want a President within survey seems to allude to the significant role played by feminist, lesbian and queer perspectives within the formation of photography as both an artistic field and academic discipline through the 1980s and 1990s, a genealogy that is often neglected in the histories of contemporary art photography and photo theory that are written and taught. Um, Characterised very schematically, one significant and major shift um, in this field of photography in the last three decades has been from a politics of representation associated with concerns surrounding identity to an interest in the classifying tendencies and material appearances of the archive. When Anne Chechkovich framed this turn, one of the ways she did so was through Zoe's project Analogue. With reference to the text that accompanies the publication on which Megan introduced um, and from which this event takes its name, Chechkovich suggests um, that the connected concerns um, of materiality and erasure as they abound to the photographic document shows, and I quote, the mutually informing value of photography theory and queer theory for innovative approaches to the archive, end quote. Here the emphasis that queer theory has placed on performativity enmeshes with the messianic ideas that underpinned Walter Benjamin's conception of history. It leaves the ephemeral fragments of the queer archive as ones that might potentially um, flash up to break open the terms of the present. So it is that Zoe's work offers the frame for thinking about the reappearance of I Want a President as it has circulated through various networks since the mid-2000s and helps us to understand how the anachronistic appearance of a text from 1992 in 2016 might work to do something political in the context of contemporary queer politics. If one of the conditions of visibility for this example of print ephemera today are the political struggles and collective formations of the present, it need be acknowledged that another is the legacy left by previous moments of queer struggle and the labour that underpins it. In times like those, as well as times like these, pockets of visibility open up in which books are published, exhibitions are mounted and materials are collected meaning that they can be more readily accessed at other times, uneven as that process is. Um, the circuitous qualities of queer cultural production described here are testament to the kind of intergenerational relationships that characterise the richest, um, if not always easiest, manifestations of queer community. In this, we might find a conception of history unmoored from the logic of success, successive movements that often underpins the writing of histories of art and the logic of successive generations that underpins the writing of histories of politics. Um, but still, times do change. In light of the gains of the mainstream LGBT rights movement, why both some queer subjects are permitted to become part of an economic relation or political citizenry, it has often been noted, um, including by Zoe herself, that the present demands its own experimental forms, that contemporary political speech might be limited when it is beholden to the terms and the objects of the past. I find myself wanting to flip this statement 
When the present becomes our horizon, we have closed the most radical possibilities that our collective political history offers. For it is always in the present that we have recourse to a practical politics, one that requires we seek legitimacy from the very institutions that prohibit claims to self-determination. To want within a two-party political system, for example, is often to be left wanting. Whilst queer culture has often had recourse to manifesto forms, it has, of course, been suspicious of them too. Manifestos are problems because programs are always at, risks, at risk of solidifying. Working against this logic, I was struck when I visited survey by what I want a president becomes when it is held by Zoe's practice. Like a hand-rendered sign on a shop front in a quickly gentrifying neighborhood or the illegitimate mark of a graffiti scroll, I want a president becomes a point of resistance through the way that it cleaves open the present. Its promise, bound up in its own erasure, always deferred, is never rendered as a fixed sign. If that seems to add up to an impossible equation, it's because its meaning is contingent on precisely that. Thank you. I'd like to begin to by thanking Megan and Christine and everyone who was involved in the invitation and uh, to thank Zoe for the show. I'm going to talk about You See I Am Here After All, which um, was a commission at, um, for Dear, Dear Beacon in 2008 it came as one of a series of works for a very low space that's at the junction between the first building and the second. It was a space that when we, and by we I mean Michael Govan, who was the director, and I laid out the presentation of Deer's collection in those spaces in conjunction with the artists. We didn't use, there was nothing that lent itself to it and it felt somewhat like a transitional space, being darker and um, having none of the, the kind of grandeur of many of the other spaces um, that were, had been made in the building. At a certain point, I began to think about how it might be used, and we began a series of presentations in which uh, work by younger artists was um, brought into the space as a result of commissions. The first of these, I think, was Vera Luta, who had made uh, works in the building with the camera obscura before the renovation began. Then Anne Lee made another work, uh, a series of photographs that looked at a quarry, a stone producing quarry that is on the train route uh, to Beacon and the stone from that quarry had been used uh, in part in the building. And the third went to Zoe. So there was some sense that the work she made would speak to the site. And I won't go into the long um, process of um, the evolution of the work, other than to say what she decided to do, unlike her predecessors, was to take the whole, the, the length of 140 feet of walls and treat it uh, as one space, one that, rather than a series of walls that had been broken up, that are broken up by the doorways into um, three uh, parts. And in doing so, she immediately gave it a scale commensurate with that uh, occupied by some of the other works in the building, such as Hannah uh, Dobovin's Kulchigeschichte and so forth. Um, in making it one work, she uh, took Niagara Falls, and again, this is something you probably know if you saw it there or if you've looked closely at it as it appears here in the exhibition. It organizes postcards of a site that was, uh, when it was discovered, was greeted as one of the great natural wonders of the world, commensurate with the sublime seen in terms of the sub 
um, aesthetics of the sublime and painted and brought to a, a, a kind of visibility culturally through the works of the Hudson River School of Painters, um, such as Henry Church. Of course, by 2000, the beginning of the 21st century, it was mediated by three centuries of representation of which postcards had become the 20th century's dominant form. And the postcards here, some 4,000, represent some seven decades of production. And they've been organized into groups which are hung along a center line, a horizon line, uh, as if the perimeter of the falls was laid out. If you're standing on the Canadian side and beginning with the Horseshoe Falls, you look down and follow. As you walk down the wall, you follow the uh, unfolding of the falls. Uh, with the vantage points of the shot of each of those images determined by uh, the horizon line and whether, therefore, it's below the horizon line or above the horizon line. There's a great deal to say about how the work works in relation to that content, and that's been done very brilliantly, I think, by three essays by Anne Reynolds, Lytle Shaw, and Angela Miller in a book that was produced in conjunction with the piece. I want to think about the site in another way and think about it uh, in relation to the title, You See I Am Here After All, which came rather late in the game. It's a title that's taken from one of the postcards. It's written on the front of the postcard, therefore visible to us as we look um, at these cards. And it was signed by Lulu and uh, dated 1906. It's one of many, many um, notes and salutations on the cards. Uh, but I think it functions as a title in a way that the salutation seems to come from the artist. You see, I'm here after all. It's almost impossible, I think, not in some, at some level to hear Zoe's voice. And I think um, we can make some sense of that if we start to think about the breaks in, in the piece and what they lead on to. And you can see the first of these is uh, into a gallery inhabited by uh, Gerhard Richter's Six Grey Mirrors. And this piece has clear affiliations or affinities with aspects of Zoe's work, above all in the kind of self-reflection and the vantage point that the viewer is, is made aware of as she stands in front of these tilted um, glass reflecting planes. But one could, of course, think of Hannah Darboven and sequencing an enormous uh, quantity of material into cultural history of, uh, that ramifies over a century through postcards, through maps, through military battles, through um, vernacular material of many, many kinds. One might also think of Palermo, Blinky Palermo's to the people of New York City and sequencing that goes out of sync to borrow a phrase, a kind of progenitor of something that Hilton Owls has so astutely seen as central to Zoe's practice. And one might think also of Robert Smithson and the non-sites that draw on diagrams, on mapping, of, on photography and material evidence of ways of referring to sites elsewhere. In um, thinking about, you see, I'm after you see I'm here after all as a site, uh, as a piece in Beacon and its transition here, I want to argue that I think it acts uh, or is put into play in similar but tellingly different ways in survey, the exhibition here at the moment. And to do this, I think one has to look at where it fits into the structure of the exhibition and to think about the way it's uh, foregrounded by reference through the, one of the early aerials and uh, the piece survey which has its title with the exhibition, which again is comprised of cards of Niagara Falls laid out um, in, um, in piles, image by image, to make a kind of model. And one, think of, one might think of modeling the site or mapping the site um, if you think um, of uh, a relationship with the, um, the model of New York City in the photographs immediately to the right. As it's laid out here, it's been tweaked slightly, but I think what's key to 
think about is the way that the doors open onto it. And again, there are three galleries that open onto it. Look not into a collection, but look into Zoe's own work, bodies of work from different times. And as you know, you see it um, from within the galleries and then you walk the length of it in order to get to the final gallery, which um, is both uh, the, the largest challenge, I think, and the kind of finale to the show. And by the largest challenge, I think that the floors of the Whitney are set up so that any artist who's making an exhibition here is confronted with the problem of how to deal with this extraordinary vista, a wall of windows that looks over a magnificent site and one that tends to blow the artworks out of the room. And some artists, I think, have got dressed it by building walls. Others have simply uh, let, let the works try and battle it out. And uh, Andrea Fraser brilliantly took all physical objects out of the room and relied on sound. I think Zoe has taken a different tact and one that we could see is keyed in by thinking about the way in which the, the entry to the room is marked through... Um, walking the length of you see I'm, after, I'm here after all. Because what people tend to do um, is they walk into the room, they tend to stop confronted by this extraordinary view, navigate around how to take and make good pictures, move up to the window, take out their cell phones, turn their backs and take, uh, take a selfie. And I imagine most of them then uh, post it and in doing so, I would say they're doing exactly, pretty much, what Lulu did. They're taking an image, they're sending it out, it's, it's a reference. I, you see, I'm here, after all. Um, and I think that this um, speaks to the act of looking in the room. It speaks to uh, who's looking. We are the tourists, the visitors, the viewers, the um, the the seers of the exhibition, but above all, the witnesses to the site and the location. And of course, the, if you look, having taken your selfie, you then look across the room and uh, you look, sorry, I've got a head, there you see the actual photograph. Um, you look across to the photographs, New York Harbour 1 and 2, where you see perhaps another kind of uh, witnessing has gone on. And in these photographs are Zoe's relatives as they arrived in New York Harbor, the view that we see out the window, coming from Europe in the aftermath of the Second World War as immigrants, as refugees from that war. And I think that in the making of our photographs, putatively or actually, and the taking of, uh, and the looking at of those photographs, uh, a very different kind of reading, but a way of thinking about location and place and site. In doing this, I'd argue that she's flipped the title. You see, I'm here after all. Now we don't see it perhaps as coming from her as her address, but our address um, in some senses. In an interview in the Brooklyn Rail, the current version, she discussed the making of survey and stated, and I'm quoting, the show is where you give it all over to the viewer. In comparing the inaugural installation of You See I'm Here After All with its current iteration, the shifting in those key terms, you, I, here, and after all, provide, I think, clues to the staging of what it is to give over. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm very grateful um, to everybody who um, made this possible for me and, um, and for those of you with a commitment to this work and to thinking about it. Um, and I, I'd like to extend that um, gratitude um, to Douglas Crimp, who's sitting in the front row right next to the artist. Um, Douglas is the reason I do this. And um, he was my advisor. 
he remains my friend and model, and um, it just it means the world to me to have uh, an opportunity like this. Uh, I don't know to share it with heroes and friends and the people who make me, who keep me in the job. <laughs> and now that I've <laughs> I've started it, so glasses would be good. <clears throat> If it's blowing up on the internet, then you know that some of your art friends are probably grumbling about it. <laughs> and indeed, in 1961, the course of blue suitcases greeting arrivers to survey has got a good number of us grumbling. I've heard it called corny, trite, and all the things that grumbling alone can say. I, I find that interesting, and it confuses me. It's not as though 1961 is super straightforward. In 2002, Leonard, then in her 41st year, initiated an unfinishable artwork. It comprises only blue suitcases uh, sourced in earthly and virtual antique stores, all in hues from the middle of that color's range. It bears some relation to Leonard's life as such. As a didactic informs us, Leonard, who was born in 1961, adds a suitcase to the sculpture annually. There is one for each year of her life. But the form and the life at hand do not align. Many of these units clearly were manufactured before Leonard's birth, and it took her until middle age to commence the work. Thus, exactly as one does not step, but rather is swept up into social relations, 1961 was swept up into Leonard's corpus as one more thing to be situated among the others. It's not, to me, art about a life's work, but rather art about life as a miscellany of labors. The load, the carrying, the crossing, the adapting, the gaining, breaking, and losing. A suitcase identifies a person with her itinerancy, with the human necessity of moving and being moved. As few personal objects can, it evokes the element in any life that involves packing up to stay alive trading the life that one knew for a new and different one, surrendering an established orientation to the things and beings of the world. I like the idea of an idiom that adapts to an agency and not the other way around. In this of Leonard's experiments, the old blue suitcase functions as the control. It's the control's job in an experiment to, to stress the dynamic. To wit, I think we have to say 1961 is one thing. To think with the work, however, is to provide for all of the considerations of pacing, timing, context, and tone change, and just plain change that we factor by default into dealing with any, uh, like any expensive work of art, expansive work of art, expansive work of art. A perception of all of these elements will be needed to liberate 1961's full and surprising range of meaning. Yet and still, the work before me isn't finished. It will be. When the artist dies, 1961 will have, formed, will have been formed one final time, at some instance during what we call the last active year. At that time, the course of blue suitcases on the floor will inherit death, and in doing so, they may likely attain some of the, uh, to some of the poignancy that many now find to be lacking in them. In this way, 1961 is thinking about life as a subject of representation that is to say, of, about representations ill-fit with the wholeness of a given life, which even she who lives it can only know in part. This complicates a commitment to representation. I hope that's clear. Such a complication is, however, good news for anyone who ever had cause to elude capture by representation. And herein lay, I suspect, some of the trouble. Although it's positioned in survey um, like a Gothic capital letter, 1961 is so richly uninformative. And yet to me, by allowing one to think this way, 1961 attains to a form of thoroughness that information cannot. The argument for the form thoroughness usually takes, that which would make an art more potent because more exact, is an argument for realism, for art as information. 1961 creates a space which is potentially an alternative to information. It reduces itself to a number, while, exhibit, while exhibiting none of a number's self-consistency. It's equally ambivalent as a proxy for a figure. The outsourced suitcases acquire their varying character not only from a clash of styles and vintages, but also from various initials, name tags, and airport codes imprinted from, upon or hanging from them. 
Everywhere they bear the impress of other human persons, other trials, other itineraries. Everywhere they point away from Leonard, forestalling if not abjuring any singularity that might obtain to her narrative. We can learn from this the following. Categorically speaking, even the old blue suitcase shares with a life the quality of being an absolute which cannot be universalized. Why blue? Why this style? I think I don't care. The artist did some work. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the artist did some work. She has something to show me. Either I can see it or I can't. Here, seeing is thinking. I'm not awaiting thoughts that will be symmetrical to the work's own. What, what good would, I don't know what good that would be. I'm made to think about key junctures, where individuals meet the historical and the procedural, where I encounter what has preceded me, where I face, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, where I face what coexists with me but cannot be bothered to draw my scale, and eventually where I encounter oblivion. Some old blue suitcases and a life as such. Mainly, I think 1971 is, like so much of Leonard's con a contribution, not something whole. What wholeness gives up is the dynamic. When present to something whole, the mind, the, the mind need only harvest. 1961, 1961 gives up wholeness, and in doing so, calls on the mind to step in and fill the void. A challenge when what faces you is, is a succession of irregular volumes, constituted as a group in the middle of the life that it means to describe, all of them fully closed. But indeed, breakage, whatever its cause, is the dark complement to the act of making. The one implies the other. The biographical entity I might otherwise feel poised and, and equipped to construct will not be made. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to echo all of the thanks that have come before um, to my fantastic colleagues who have worked on this evening's program, as well as all of the wonderful ones that have come before it. Um, to so many of you in this room who have officially or unofficially been a part of the journey that has been Zoe Leonard's survey at the Whitney, and of course to Zoe. Um, I can't believe we're almost at the end of this part, um, but it's been a real joy. Um, so um, for many of you who have been um, so-called or, or somewhat like season ticket holders to our public programs for this show, um, this story is going to be familiar to you, but I hope that, oh, <laughs> did I touch something? Oh. I'm good, okay. <laughs> um, but I hope uh, that uh, we all know that Zoe and her work thrive on repetition. And so I hope that through that repetition, um, we can all learn something new. Um, so I want to tell the story of um, the work um, that we have on view right now, uh, Homage, um, and how it came to be. Um, I was working on my essay for the catalog um, that accompanies the exhibition and thinking um, a lot about um, Zoe's responses to and conversations with architecture throughout her uh, career and was um, looking at and thinking deeply about her site-specific installation for Documenta in 1992 in Kassel, of which you see an image here. Um, for this project, uh, Zoe uh, deinstalled um, a number of the paintings hung in the Neue Gallery in Kassel, all of the paintings in which um, the subject matters did not include women or their bodies. Um, and around the remaining paintings, um, which were the majority of the paintings in the gallery, um, she hung her own photographs um, uh, of women's vaginas, uh, vulva, being maybe the more technical term, the pussy photographs, as she calls them. Um, I 
began a conversation with Zoe about this project, understanding, of course, its site specificity, um, and wondering if there was a way uh, to reimagine it or um, bring it into our exhibition. Uh, we began the conversation by talking about the Whitney's permanent collection, given that this original um, installation was around a permanent collection that seemed like the obvious uh, next place to go. Um, but I think we very, very quickly understood that um, the Whitney's collection and its building and its moment and its site are so vastly different from the Neue Gallery in Kassel in 1992 that that would not have the same effect. Um, so we began talking about the Whitney's building and the Whitney's site um, and the Whitney's moment. And um, we began talking about the ethos that um, I came to understand this building was built under or sort of the mythology um, that we all created in um, touring the building in the days that it was under construction um, and when it was first open. Um, we were taught to say a lot, taught or began or um, came to say a lot of things like the porosity of the building, um, the porosity that the building has between interior and exterior, and the porosity that the building has between public and private spaces. So we identified, um, from that conversation, we identified all of the spaces in the building uh, where this public and private juncture meets. And we started to have a conversation about reinstalling these original photographs in each of those locations. Um, this began a long process of engaging directly um, with the Whitney as an institution. Um, it's a very interesting thing what an artwork is asked to, how an artwork is asked to answer for itself when it slips out of the bounds of the gallery space and into the um, public ambulatory kind of non-controlled space of an institution. Um, and so through a series of extensive conversations with my colleagues, um, colleagues all throughout the museum, both uh, colleagues in charge of thinking about staff well-being, public well-being, our education colleagues, school groups, um, we tested the limits of this project to see um, if it would be possible. And um, we got approval. <laughs> Um, which was quite incredible um, to really have to kind of move this set of questions, this idea uh, through the system of the institution and watch it respond, um, especially in a moment um, of great se sensitivity um, in our culture at large for the Whitney. Um, and then uh, after we got approval, we started to do a lot of testing, um, hanging mock-ups of the photographs in the spaces. Um, and this was all about the time um, that the Harvey Weinstein news broke. Um, and a combination of um, seeing these uh, photographs from 1992 in spaces in 2018, um, seeing that lapse of time, that distance of space, and then this news, and this news with um, salacious stories surrounding it, photographs of uh, the women who the stories were being told about um, accompanying them, quickly made us understand that the effect, the power, the rupture, um, the gesture of these photographs in 1992 did not have the same place in 2018. But we'd found these spaces. Um, we'd found this crack, this sliver, um, this place to explore and expand the exhibition, to ask questions, to grow, um, and we couldn't give that up. Um, we had a lot of conversations about space throughout the planning of this exhibition. Um, who is given space, how much space, what kind of space does an artwork take up? Can an artwork take up? Um, I've been thinking a lot about square footage. What does it mean to calculate the square footage of an exhibition? What does it mean um, 
to, to limit um, the way in which we think about the exterior of these projects in that way. And this is something that, of course, Zoe has been examining um, throughout her work. So as we sat with these uh, imaginary empty spaces, um, the possibility of using them, uh, more news kept coming out. Um, the Knight Landesman Art Forum news broke. Um, and then very shortly after, uh, Linda Nochlin passed away. And I always feel like I'm telling Zoe's part of the story here um, because I'm sitting at my office upstairs while this is all happening. Um, but uh, Linda Nochlin passed away and Zoe was on her way back to Texas and decided to reread um, Nochlin's uh, well-known essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists on the Plane on the Way Back to Texas, um, a text she hadn't read since her early 20s. Um, she got off the plane, she texted me, she said, I think I have a crazy idea. I'm not sure um, if it's something yet, but let's talk about it. Um, and we did. Um, this text, I think, um, it came to be partially because of the timing, um, but it spoke so directly uh, to the spaces that we had, de had identified and the project that we um, had set out to accomplish in a way. It really spoke to the literal walls, the structures of the institution um, that we were examining. And so Zoe went through the text um, and selected key excerpts that really um, got to the heart of uh, Nochlin's question, um, got to this uh, question about institutional structures and who they admit and who they exclude. Um, and we screen printed these around the building um, on every floor um, except for the one um, that the exhibition is on uh, simply because there is not one of these public private spaces on that floor. But it became this kind of container or framing for the exhibition itself. Um, and on each floor this question is repeated um, just like it is in the essay but like this, this kind of mantra over and over, why have there been no great women artists? Why have there been no great women artists? Why have there been no great women artists? Um, in thinking about where this work really lies, I think physically and conceptually, um, I keep coming back to the structures of these spaces. Um, I don't have a picture right there. Um, the glass walls that really are uh, the membrane between where the staff work and where the public is allowed to access. And this idea of a membrane, um, I'm a few pages behind in my notes, I apologize. <laughs> a membrane being um, a selective barrier that allows some things to pass through but stops others. Um, I also have been thinking a lot about um, what we're bringing in from the past. Um, I know uh, something that Zoe has said a lot that I know Lynn says a lot, um, this idea of the past never being past. Um, and while the past is never past, it of course brings with it um, reminders of its moment, uh, the, the particularities of the time in which it came from. And so what does it mean to uh, revisit a text from 47 years ago, unaltered, unupdated, um, with all of the uh, signs of its time of, of um, 1971. So these are all the formal qualities of this work. Um, and I think part of the reason I am struggling to really have some distance from it and think um, even more critically about it is that I work inside this space. I pass by these texts every day. I move through this membrane of public and private. I have that access, um, as do my colleagues. Um, and we had a uh, conversation between Zoe and the staff the other day um, where staff were invited to come and share their thoughts and their reflections with her. Um, and it's clear that um, 
this work has really posed a challenge. I think it has challenged uh, the dynamics of our meeting spaces, the dynamics of our workflow, uh, the dynamics of our interactions between us and the public. Um, the public has gotten even more eager to cross that membrane than they already are, and trust me, they are very eager. Um, and it has raised questions about um, what is different than 1971? How could we ask these questions today? Um, but ultimately, um, I think this experiment um, and it, the ongoing questions it poses um, are, are raising important challenges to our institutional structure, to the way our staff think about the work that we do and the way we engage um, with those who come to see that work. Um, so on that very non-conclusion conclusion, conclusion um, I would like to invite uh, my fellow speakers uh, up to the stage for a little bit of conversation, and then I think we'll have uh, some time for questions. Thank you. So I promised I would sort of play the role of moderator, but since I need a drink of water, um, <laughs> do any of you, oh, thank you, do any of you um, have a comment, a thought, a question for each other that you want to start with? Can I ask you a question, Elizabeth? Of course, Lynn. Um, I thought a lot about the way that I see you see um, what it posed to DIA as an institution in 2008 and what um, homage does to the Whitney now. And the way, one, of, one of the ways I started to tease it out was, of course, that 2008 DIA was an institution that began in the 70s with a small number of artists, white, male, American and German artists. By the time the museum opened in Beacon, that list had expanded a little with um, the inclusion of women artists such as Louise Bourgeois, Agnes Martin, uh, Hannah Darboven, uh, On Kawara, and, and so on. Um, that was an incremental shift. And in a sense, then looking at, thinking about the the questions that Linda Nochlin raises, I mean, the first thing one might want to say is, well, of course there have been great women artists. It's incontestable, Louise Bourgeois, Agnes Martin. But it seems to me that the question that isn't the, in, these inclusions of a small number of figures that start to read as token figures is not at all what's at stake. It's structural change. And the glass ceilings and the many other systemic forms of restriction limitation that operate. Can you tell me how you thought, did you think of it in relation to UC and how did you think of it in relation to the questions that, really the literalness of the question, why have there been no great women artists? Um, I'll answer the second part so that I can maybe think about the first part while I'm talking. Um, I mean, that's really what Nochlin is is answering in her text is that um, we have to forget about exceptionalism, that of course um, a few people break through here and there, but think about all of the people who we don't know about who haven't broken through or, or who are mediocre because of these institutional structures. Um, and so that was part of, I think, maybe I'm already losing your question, but what felt really relevant to me um, someone not of Zoe's generation, but not maybe the youngest um, working generation, um, that this insistent reminder of the institutional structures that keep out not only women, but um, all marginalized people, be it race, class, or otherwise, um, are still just as prevalent, no matter, um, no matter how many more exceptions have been made, no matter how many more people have broken through. Um, so, um, it felt like a really important thing 
to have the institution have to reckon with on a day-to-day -day basis as we did our work. Um, can you ask me the UC part again? Um, I guess what I was getting at is, is in UC, it's, it's, the question is posed in relation to artworks, right. um, to a different generation, uh, artworks to which Zoe has um, great interest, affiliation, difference, and separation. But um, here it's posed not in relation to the collection, it's posed in, literally in relation to the infrastructure. Mm -hmm and to an apparent transparency that really is not, or, or has very limited right. porosity or transparency. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm to, no, that's I, okay. I still want you to. No, that, that, yeah, I mean, those are all of the things that we've been talking about and thinking about. Um, you know, I think it's also interesting, I mean, the way that you talked about the difference between um, UC's uh, installation at DIA and its installation here and what changes and it similarly um, the work is being played kind of more off the building than a collection um, and I, I do I do think I mean I'm so fascinated by the way that you see engages with architecture and the body and, and sort of the choreography of the body and the way that the um, individual has to um, navigate and kind of create meaning through movement. I think that that um, very similarly plays out in homage and, and with very different and um, more complicated choreographies. Um, but I think that for me, they're pairing really well in speaking both internally to institutional structures as well as externally to these kind of greater structures that control even an institution like the Whitney, the institutions that control the institution. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that was an answer, but maybe Thanks. it's someone, yeah. <laughs> what? <coughs> I, think I want to ask an unformed question about um, movement in the sense that you, Elizabeth, just um, invoked it. Um, and it's a question, I think, for ev like everybody except Zoe, um, <laughs> at least at first, because it, it, it may have an answer, and that would take the fun out of asking it, asking the question. Um, but the, um, so first of all, it, it comes from um, a recent bit of knowledge that I've acquired about how incredibly slowly your work happens to me. Um, how it, it seems to me like an incredibly slow art in the sense that I, I'm, I'm, I'm always struck by the amount of time it's taken me to learn from the way that it's made me look, to learn from the way that it made me think, and to learn from the ways in which it made me feel. Um, too long, sometimes in the sense that I become impatient and think that was nothing, or I was wrong about that at first, um, or any number of other misprisions, what end up being misprisions after some deeper reflection. But so the time it takes is just, I mean, I'm, I'm ready to ascribe it to the work as such, as a quality, personally. And I, I don't know what an argument for that would look like, but I feel some kind of conviction about this. But, but what that means is that the movement that one is forced to do in, negoti in negotiating a given object in a, in, a given, in a particular situation, like the ones that we have upstairs, all differently configured, all differently durational, but all, all involving time, a, a movement that I experience as a movement in time that entails the negotiation of differences, which you have found, um, among things that are ostensibly the same. Again and again, and I'm, to move is to negotiate differences. And um, so the movement that the intervention of Linda's language becomes a part of in being institutionalized, it joins a movement in a, in a social political sense of, of movement. It joins a movement and you have, you have conscripted yourselves, as it were, to a, a, a new f stage or phase of, of, the f of, of, of a feminist movement. Um, so in, in doing so, the, it, 
what becomes urgent is to know something about how the institution is itself being carried along, moved forward, shifted at least a little, whether not, if, if, if not along some kind of um, linear chronological political trajectory, then at least how is it being unsettled? Like how is it losing its shape in response to the movement that it's being made to do? And um, I, that's a question. And maybe not a yes or no after all. And I don't, I don't mean to just come at you again and again with this, but I, I'm just, as you spoke in response to Lynn's question, I was just, I was hit again by, the, by what seems to me like an almost uncannily, <clears throat> an almost uncannily tight fit between the way I'm made to move along and through your work, Zoe's work, and the kind of movement that your use of Linda's words means to induce. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I agree, was what I was going to say, sense? yeah. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. So um, I hope it, I hope I mean, I think, of course, there were so many ideas in there, and I also want someone else to talk, but um, I think, um, I mean, I think time is one of the reasons I struggled with what to say and how to talk about this piece, because I very fundamentally don't feel like I know it yet. Um, I, um, I'm both too close to its genesis as well as, you know, as I s said, kind of still um, in interacting with it, moving through it every day to have any space for reflection. Um, I'm, it also makes me think a little bit, and again, not a direct answer, but when you were talking, I wrote down and underlined twice the idea of unfinishable in Zoe's work, and um, so maybe I throw that back to you. It would be nice to open it up to yeah. others. Too. Yeah, um, I wonder if maybe I could speak to this a little. Um, when it, it's always surprising to me that the way that, that I've ended up approaching um, Zoe's work in my own writing is through. Um, uh, the I Want a President text because I don't get any of the pleasures from that text that I get from the work. Um, and I guess I've, um, I've sort of struggled with um, uh, w what it... The, the movement of that text through... Um, a, a sort of various networks and institutions um, in which um, the authorship of the text as an artwork seems to threaten to solidify in particular ways, but also in ways that are extremely important. Um, uh, you know, when we think about the ways that um, women's authorship is so often um, and and so yeah, so often has been sort of historically elided. Um, but I guess I was sort of thinking, like what it what it allows, um, in the context of the exhibition, is to think precisely about like these two, what seem to be these sort of two different times. So like, there's the time of a sort of political activism as it sort of needs to unfold, um, and and unfold at um, sometimes at extreme speed. Um, uh, um, because of it being a question about um, survival, um, and then at this, and then at the same time, this like incredibly slow way that um, um, the the work of um, that you you're just you know that the, that you're describing sort of unfolds within. Um, the space of the exhibition, but in and and um, in fact becomes where the sort of possibility of it being um, uh, finished becomes a kind of um, uh, well, it's not it's it the it finds its power in the fact of never being a sort of finished project, and I think it's those like those two temporalities are sort of they're so important to thinking about political activism because you have on the one hand the sort of, yeah, the sort of um, aesthetic dimension of 
um, politics in the way that um, uh, an art work or art can sort of constitute two like major shifts in social imaginary and then the way that we might think about how an institution like the Whitney needs to change in relation to this political moment. I, um, the, this idea of authorship, you sort of started to talk about it at the beginning and you spoke about it in your talk a bit. Lynn, you talked about it in your work or in your, in your talk. Um, um, and even I think in a way, Darby, you alluded to it. I'm, I'm curious to hear more. Um, and even it obviously has a lot to do with homage and where does the authorship lie and who's speaking and who, or even what's just the viewer's perception of who's speaking and who's claiming those questions, those words. Um, so I'm curious if anybody has any th bigger thoughts about these ideas of authorship and speech. Well, I, <clears throat> I think that, sorry, everybody. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Welcome to me. Um, uh, That's how I feel right now. Yeah, it's like I think the, I think one thing that the, there's um, with th there's an openness that I think is equally um, um, an attitude toward the same and the different, which has always been seems to me, which has always been open to the 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 inevitability of, of difference overwhelming like any possibility of the same. It's just gonna it's gonna get you. And that's just a resignation that, that was made a long time ago from which an attitude about speaking um, issues, which um, manifests for me again and again as a willingness on, on, on Zoe's part to, to speak with others, to, to, and to have open her voice up to involvement by other voices. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a clever kind of choral, it's not an orchestrated, um, it's 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 coincidental speech, or something. So that authorship is just it's just spread out um, in 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 the very uh, the very sensing of the fact that the voice is coming that, that the voice is not singular but coming from at, at least two places. Um, in survey where I don't know how many authors of books about how to do photography are annexed to a single work by Zoe Leonard, you have a glaring example of a, a kind of um, an al an almost theatrically multiple. A, a polyphony of voices, whereas in a work like Tipping Point, which I have thought about very, for a long time, the stack of James Baldwin first editions of The Fire Next Time, you know, there's just one other voice, but that voice is actually um, the cadence and the urgency and the need we have for it is actually varying um, annually. It's being, its amplitude is being, is being adjusted as, you know, as, as by the bar of a dial annually. That's, 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 that's why 53 in 2016. So I don't, I don't know, like there's just, there's just an openness that's always been there, which seems to me the only way to orient oneself to difference as, a, as an actuality. And um, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I guess I was, I, I um, again have often perhaps thought about this in terms that are constrained by thinking um, through survey, um, although I think what Darby said really speaks to this, the, the, the idea of a sort of chorus or kind of accidental or um, uh, uh, kind of unattended co chorus has been uh, in extre is extremely applicable to thinking about I want a precedent and um, I think there was there was something which I which is a, it's a relationship to authorship and a relationship to biography and that, again, sort of thinking about this, I mean, not in any way to intend to sort of pin down this text or, or to name it as a sort of manifesto, but to think about what the manifesto form offers in terms of thinking about it is um, uh, this, uh, often this like e extreme proximity that manifestos have to biography that they become sort of partly really useful documents for art historians and partly like ones that really, uh, like one needs to be very cautious of because of the sort of over um uh, quality of characteristic of those documents for the work, um, which isn't sort of, it, it seems to work very 
differently. Like, I want a president is not a text which tells us anything about, um, or, or it doesn't explicitly tell us anything about Zoe's work. Um, but I was thinking about the way that um, when this text gets like written into um, survey alongside other projects like Faye Richards' um, photo archive, we begin to sort of see explicitly the relationship of the work to queer community and to uh, New, New York and to a sort of scene of organizing and activism in New York, which absolutely eschews like any kind of soul authorship. And when you're sort of looking at the names of the people who were involved in the Faye Richards photo archive, that like becomes really clear um, in a way that perhaps it doesn't through I Want a President. But there was something else that I sort of was thinking about these like intergenerational dialogues in kind of queer community and queer activism and um, like that on the one hand it, it makes me feel very optimistic to sort of think about like how mobile this text has been and all of these sort of networks that it's traveled from and then on the other this thing which is sort of about like how it's um, uh, like how it begins to accrue a certain kind of capital for younger artists who um, reference or respeak or um, uh, the text, and so and I feel like that's always its intention. Like I don't, I don't want to sort of, I, I don't think um, uh, I would not want to sort of so s cynically say that that's like the only thing that's op operating in the respeaking of the text. But it's about a kind of like the way that connecting to an and another author's name produces a lineage, which is a political imperative, and then at the same time is also about the accumulation of like a certain kind of cultural capital. So it was quite a long answer. <laughs> uh, I suppose I, I would think about authorship in terms of making exhibitions as, an, as another place where authorship operates. And uh, the way in which a work, that the exhibition can be a work, and it's the, the putting into dialogue of the works that construct uh, not just a narrative, but a narrative that's coming from, from somewhere. It's, it's authored. And, and therefore, that the body of work, the oeuvre, the, like the full corpus of works, is so labile and open-ended and unfinished that they, selections can be drawn out of them to construct different narratives with different voices because there are multiple subjectivities because of the terms you've been talking, you've all been talking about. I mean, I'd love to, I'd lo I mean, I, I think that the, <clears throat> I agree so completely that I want to add more. That makes no sense. Um, that actually makes no sense. So I, I don't think. No. Well, I, what was I hearing? I'm hearing. A, I mean, I was hearing something. I was hearing you describe a, some of my physical memories of seeing the show for the first couple of times are memories of um, being feeling quite turned around um, in a, in a succession of spaces that isn't particularly confusing to navigate or to, to see even. And, and, and one is, I mean, the sight lines are such that one is able to anticipate a good amount of what's to come, which is nice. And sometimes I, I experience that as different from the norm in exhibitions of, of, of complex art that um, is project-based and series-based. I find, I, I remember, you know, having, you know, I don't know, it didn't feel particularly dramatic, you know. And yet um, I would, because of the time it takes to just to see something, even something that you think you know, you know, a degree of immersion has taken place in the course of a looking that out of which one needs to be somewhat like kind of snapped. <laughs> and then, okay, where do I, where do I go now is a, is a question, even though I know exactly where, where, where to go now. I'm being drawn um, as by some kind of magnetism in a direction, but I don't particularly know why, why I'm going that way. In, in that moment, because the total because the takeover by the work that I've been looking at and its way of making me think about looking at it, um, it is, so, um, is so sticky. And so I think the, I mean, that felt authored 
that, that felt like a situation that had been brought about, not, um, not merely eventuated through the process of a hang with a kind of model-based hang where you do the model and hang the model, install the model. It, 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 felt, it felt intervened upon and shaped. And so I think that maybe that's just another level on which one might register what, what Lynn has observed and, um, and what I hear Laura saying. Do we want to take some questions from our, yeah, before? Could we have more lights? So yeah. <laughs> oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> hello. Um, I had a question about photography. Um, and not that I would like to claim that Zoe is primarily a photographer at all, but I'm curious that in all four of your presentations that you know, we talked primarily about installation or intervention installations, archival-based works, which also use photography, but not Zoe's own. And I was just curious, um, I don't know how you guys came to the objects you talked about, and if, you know, there was a snag in your thinking of trying to evaluate the photos in terms of history, or just, I'm just kind of curious where photography could be in this discussion? Well, I'll just jump in really quickly because I, I sort of copped out in my talk and I had like all these connections I wanted to draw, but I decided to just put the works up behind me and make you figure it out. <laughs> um, but um, I mean, I very specifically um, wanted to show preserved head of a bearded woman um, because I think of, you brought up, I think, history and um, probably because I think that's originally how this discussion was partially framed, um, but we all decided to talk about whatever we wanted to. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, and I was really interested in thinking about how this work kind of similarly operates by bringing something from the past really uh, dripping with its pastness, with the artifacts of the moment in which it's from, into the present, but into the present through these multiple membranes, these multiple, um, these multiple falsely porous surfaces. Um, and so I, I started to think about how, um, and also the multiplicity of image, the repetition, um, of course these are, moves that are common in Zoe's work, but um, I think that, um, yeah, of course, I, and I think a lot about the relationship between the photography and uh, what we talked about today. That wasn't an answer. <laughs> I mean, I, I think to, um, I was asked to talk about the text that I've talked about, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. No, but exactly. I mean, I think I think there's like um, there's numerous ways that we can think of. Uh, uh, I want a president um, uh, through the frame of photography or alongside thinking about um, the photographic medium. One is that it. I would say primarily uh, circulates as an image um, at, at present um, and um, uh, and in that way I was thinking um, Lynn when you were talking about I hadn't really made this connection between uh, thinking about the postcard as a form and then the way that um, I want a president sort of circulates <coughs> really in um, in terms of a sort of online platform um, uh, it kind of well it's sort of folded back on itself because um, uh, it sort of had that life after the work rather than pre preceding its entry into the work but it's um, it sort of seems that yeah it's very much the kind of same mechanism um, but it, I've, yes, and then I think there's a way of thinking about um, manifestos as um, uh, 
in, in, in many ways in parallel to the way that I think photography is, appears through Zoe's work. So like thinking about the challenge to the like epistemic um, status of the document, um, uh, the, the relationship of um, the document to the production of knowledge around subjects and um, to um, the, uh, the tension between the... Um, uh, the sort of uh, the threat of violence which is embedded in um, uh, the document and the way in which that can be sort of held in tension with this sort of like a kind of quite radical proposal around um, thinking subjectivity um, and thinking uh, the knowledges that surround the production of subjectivities otherwise. So I would sort of I, I found it really useful to begin, and I guess this was what I was sort of trying to get at, that actually when folded back into the way that Zoe thinks uh, as a photographer, um, I think the text becomes something else, which I don't necessarily see it sort of... Um, uh, it's, it's not necessarily the way that you sort of first see it when you see it sort of circulating or kind of like pinned as a billboard or sort of re-spoken in a kind of public square. Can I just say two things that jumped to mind as soon as um, the question was posed? The first is that I think that a lot of the time what I feel to be the, uh, what I feel the work to be um, an attempt to do or to show is something that a photograph cannot even begin to approach. Um, so it's it's off it's 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 off the list of possible mediums that one might use to make the effect happen, um, and an example is you know actually there's something spectacularly difficult to photograph about the piece I discussed 1961. It's very I mean it's all over Instagram, but it's very difficult to to, to see what I what what happens I think. Um, it took me fully 11 paces from the wall to get to the end. Um, it's two completely different things from the side, from either side. It's a it's a punctuation mark from the tip. Um, looking back, it obscures the view of almost the entire length of 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 the object. And from the top, it's this crazy topography of of you know stuff that I mentioned, like name tags and 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 initials and colors and handle styles and stitching types and like wow, there's the third one in is the same as the first one or the second one is the same as the fifth, all kinds of things that that no, a, a photograph is just not up to the task of 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 uh, giving it any insight into. That's one thing. That's a formally grounded reason why I felt no no use. In fact, there's nothing that could have been useful for me about a turn to photography, even for even for a single clause. The second thing is that I, I think what the show shows is that this is a practice that is constantly throwing throwing its own body out of that medium for a reason. It's not it's not a, a practice that is interested in being affiliated finally with a single artistic medium. Um, it's from a time after that was an obligation that an artist needed to feel, pursue, or even vaguely worry about satisfying. Um, that's part of its historicity. And um, it, it reminds me of that all of the time by, by, by being the work of a photographer th that is not a, itself a photograph. Um, that makes more room in photography. But it also allows uh, the art to make incursions in, into the areas where necessity is felt. Um, so it just seems to me not talking about photography is one way to get this artist's work right. Not, uh, not a, a way to get it wrong. And maybe just one other thing to add is as photographs, these are already always in space. They're not framed. They're put on the walls um, in ways that they bleed into the space. They're hung typically with an exceptional amount of space around them, and therefore their location as objects, not, we see them as objects constantly, but we don't see them as objects because they're framed things that have a, a dimensional materiality in, the, in a traditional way. We see them as objects because of the space that's so actively part of the viewing of each and any of them. And I think that one can't, or at least as I 
Cantazelli's work, it doesn't matter whether it's in the medium of photography or it's in the medium um, of sculpture in the form of a suitcase or, or, any, or a text. That seems to be true of all of the embodiments. Um, and, and in that sense, whilst there are many ways to talk about photography and histories of photography and vernacular forms of photography and functional photography, prior to any of that, I think, is this, this uh, other condition. Thank you. I was struck by Darby's comments about movement in space. And I began thinking about the text of Nochlin and how trapped it was within the curatorial staff space. And I wondered if you ever thought of liberating why there are no great women artists through projection into the mobile space that was so adeptly explained by Darby that you're drawn here and then there's another. You don't figure it out. You move through it. And I saw the projection on the floor, on the ceiling, and then moving through the space why there are no great women artists. And I wondered if that was part of your discussion Elizabeth, when you were planning the piece or the uh, exhibition? Um, well, th that would have been a question for Zoe um, as I took my cues from her. But um, in our conversations about these spaces and how we identified them, it was really um, the fact of the transition and that moment of transition from public to private and what um, the false, I mean, as it, I think it was, I didn't say and meant to say and someone else might have, the falseness of the promise of transparency of what's behind that glass. And so it's actually that trappedness that I think is really at the heart of the questions the work is asking. Um, and, you know, in this um, staff conversation we had the other day, somebody did describe how, for example, in my offices, in the curatorial offices, um, I think I even brought, I think that was my last picture, anyway, um, you can stand at the glass door and see uh, the Hudson River, and so there are constantly visitors standing there um, looking at us doing our work and taking a picture of the view out the window. and we open the door to try to go to the bathroom and they don't move out of the way because they're trying to take their picture. So there's already this great eagerness and desire and I think um, curiosity but maybe even sense of ownership from the visitor over that space and that moment of transition. But what uh, a colleague said in this conversation the other day was that um, it's only, uh, uh, amplified that volume significantly and that there's this almost hunger by the visitor to get onto the other side. And I think that that in so many ways is, is um, again, the questions that Linda was asking and the questions that the work is posing again. So to liberate it, um, I hope we can. Maybe that's the way I'll say it. <laughs> Another question? Okay. I just have a, it's more of an observation, but it has, a, I think it has something to do with, well, of, of what you've all spoken about, but um, so to your remarks about uh, 1961, I've always been struck on how in some ways as much as they describe Zoe's journey uh, each one is a portrait of somebody we probably don't know um, in the way in which they're all different and their stickers, where they've come from, you know, all those things. And there's something also about a chorus. So there's the authorship of the person putting this work out there and making this work, but there's also this chorus of other people 
Um, whether it be from the postcards, the handwritten note, all those things, they're there. Whether you see them or not, there's, I, I hear them, you know, and I think the piece that really uh, puts that forward is probably Strange Fruit. Um, so I, I just, I'm, I'm always very struck uh, in the sense of things that are serial and how I'm listening to those and moving in and out of them and then how this exhibition, how you walk through it and navigate. Um, and also I, um, with the, all the book pieces, especially the one facing the Hudson River, you have, it look, they look like buildings, the, right? And again, that talks about a larger group of people or a bigger chorus. And so I always feel that, that with Zoe's work, there's a very big openness that way. And you spoke to that too, but it's just more of a observation. In the back. Um, I'm going to take a chance here, um, just on an observation. Would you mind holding um, the mic to your mouth? Hello? Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, better? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, one thing I like to think about is um, we moved at one time from water to land. And you've talked about this show being political, social, and private. And I think the political part of it mostly is about being gay in the gay world. And so not only thinking from going from land to water, but the gay world is, non, is not reproductive. So I think about moving from physicality into consciousness. So the suitcases, I'm telling you, this is a chance. <laughs> the suitcases is, I mean, as you mentioned, it's a, it, it's a slow process. The suitcases is a whole lifetime of empty spaces. They're like empty wombs. And everything in the show seems to be dealing with memory. Like the suitcases are old. There's the... Family it is this beautiful, deep love, but it's all about kind of a memory. But the suitcases are like a travel somewhere. We're moving. Um, and I like the thought of that moving from physicality to consciousness, and then there's this memory. Well, what do you think? Too far? Maybe a little too far from what I see, but not necessarily too far from your own experience of of the work. I mean, one one function of the openness is that it it, it is not predetermining readings. <clears throat> I mean, hours are privileged today, but only then. Um, I myself would take issue with a number of the terms. Uh, well, well, sure. I mean, well, I mean, al already the gay world is not a real place, um, but um, but the um, you know parts of it, in fact, are have not um, entailed a a, a a recusal or you know a, a renouncement of of reproduction. So, not to mention the fact that everybody in such a world has has been. You know, has benefited in some way from reproduction. <laughs> so, but but also, you know, I, I I think the kind of shift that you're describing um, is is it seems to me like precisely the kind of um, uh, descriptive or uh, interpretive device that that the work doesn't doesn't necessarily in in endorse in the most full-hearted way. I myself more often than not feel that 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 kind of narration of development um, uh, and so forth is is very difficult to pull off in the face of this work, precisely because of the way the difference functions within it. Um, an artist in, interested in working in series is not enjoined to repetition. And I think Zoe proves that as well as anybody. Um, it's not one thing after another, it's one, one problem of the same after another. Like, whoa, what happened to the sameness that I ascribed to this thing when I walked in? What happened to the sameness that I need from it in order to take a biographical, um, take, take a set of biographical uh, data 
away from it. Um, so I'm I'm constantly assailed by the absence of what I may I may I may think I've 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 seen, and uh, that that's that's an, an insight into the, a a way the work works that it's taken me a long time to arrive at. But but at this point I feel pretty good about it. Pretty good saying from the chair in front in the front of the room that you know. <laughs> Give it another chance. Uh, one final question, or? OK, well, um, I just want to thank you all once again, each of you for being up here this evening, each of you for being in this room, Zoe, for giving us a reason to have this conversation. <laughs> It's been an honor, it's been a privilege. Um, thank you all.